From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand would-be worlds. I'm not sure that there's any succulent tidbits to offer about the Marvel films. I mean, we've all seen a lot of these, well, maybe not Thor The Dark World, but there's a particular blend of superhero punches that combine to make the perfectly irresistible cup of face punch coffee. G-O-T-G, before it was the omnipresent juggernaut that it is today, really seemed like a gamble for Marvel. There were absolutely no known quantities to this and no character that really stuck out as obvious choices to market to an audience. I mean, before this came out, who knew that we were going to go ape shit for a tree or a raccoon or a literal ultimate Marvel team up between a raccoon and a tree? Think about it. If this movie proved that it could do anything, it certainly proved that Marvel could do anything. Guardians of the Galaxy, they already know this. Designed, let me do it! Guardians of the Galaxy, damn it, was a 2014 film written and directed by James Gunn. I don't want to say he took a Jeffy and Family Circus like pathway to get to that position, but he like definitely did. And that's what I want to focus on for a lot of this because somehow this gamble, the space gamble, was both more dangerous and less dangerous than a lot of people were led to believe. I'll explain what I mean by the space gamble in a second, but first. Do you know what Troma is? But did you know? Troma Entertainment, are we really doing this? Troma Entertainment is an independent film company whose Wikipedia page contains the helpful phrase, many Troma films contain social commentary. Cool. Troma was created by Lloyd Kaufman, in fact that's him right there, and Michael Hertz in 1974, and as they were still building the company, they did production support on films that were not their own. Like Kaufman was the production manager on My Dinner with Andre as one of the first Troma productions. But don't worry, it gets weird from there. Toxic Avenger, Class of Newcomb High, you know, high art. Enter James Gunn, the writer of Tromeo and Juliet, a film Kaufman directed, and here begins our journey. After the Troma days, and there were a lot of them, Gunn went on to write both Scooby-Doo movies, wrote and directed Slither and Super, wrote the 2004 Dawn of the Dead remake, and all kinds of really goofy and weird stuff. He was an actor in, in Loco Cycle? Pfwa! And not to put too big a bow on this, but let's just say his name wouldn't come up first when people at Marvel were talking about who they wanted to direct this film. Hey, who should we get to write and direct our universe-expanding space opera? What about the riskiest possible Option. Sounds good. Let's go get croissant witches to celebrate. And when I say riskiest, I mean I don't think Disney executives got too excited about the prospect of the dude who played insane masturbator in Sergeant Kabuki Man public service announcement, but I don't know, maybe they party. His resume doesn't exactly scream large budget Marvel film, and that's really why it worked. They took the risk and swung for the fences, and let's just say that they hit the ball $773 million worldwide. <sighs> out of the park, which brings us to The Space Gamble. Though both Marvel and DC have a library of literally thousands of characters, but quite a few of those aren't really unlocked on the big screen until you go through all the steps to allow an audience to accept further expansions of the universe. Doctor Strange brought us magic and therefore the stable of magic characters. Avengers brought us the shared universe and Guardians brought in that last piece, cementing Thanos into the universe and volunteering in an ironically literal sense to hold the Marvel universe together. They can now now make whatever they want. I mean, they brought Howard the Duck back in the movie, which was baby buck choice. Before Guardians, Marvel had made all of these movies, and outside of Thor, they weren't really experimenting in space with actual space, not just another planet, but the gamble is important because you have to bring in characters that are actually traveling between planets in literal space. If you want to really build firm connections between all of these different franchises, you know, if you're not going to use Star Jammers to do that, in a lot of ways, Marvel 
Marvel is the Marvel we know today because they took measured, patient steps to work their way to a point they would not only be comfortable with this, but actually excited for it. Ignoring for a moment that this is a mega budget superhero movie, this is still a pretty interesting gamble, especially when you consider where DC is at in all of this. Though to be fair, DC did be Marvel to having a solo female film, but Marvel won the space race, which brings us to the actual deal of the day. To what I'm sure is entirely Gunn's credit, Guardians is grounded in a down-to-earth, metaphorically and actually, drama, which at first is Peter's biological family and then it's his chosen family, but most importantly, the characters are allowed to be imperfect. Hell, most of the villains in this movie are good guys in the second one, you know, that aren't Ronan. Sorry dude, you are too bad to make good, which is oddly sort of true, everyone starts bad, and by that I mean definitely a villain, but circumstances draw them together and force them to have to use each other to survive, forming a bond and ultimately becoming the good guys. Which is generally true of everyone who isn't the big GC. And let's talk about this cast because holy artichokey, this is some darn tootin' hot dams. Anchoring the film is Chris Pratt, who before this movie in Zero Dark Thirty, I remind you, looked like this. But then he got marveled. What's important to the Peter Quill character is in a moment of flailing desperation to alter the course of what truly could not be altered, Peter is kidnapped and brought to space as a 12 year old. There is no doubt as to why this movie made Chris Pratt a star because who else could portray the somehow likable and endearing, debilitatingly affable man-child qualities of Quill like Pratt could. Then you have Zoe Saldana as Gamora, sister of Karen Gillan's Nebula, who I thought were a bit underserved in the movie, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that they were both working overtime to make you see the people beneath the makeup, because when you really stop and think about it, Nebula is practically a Buffy the Vampire Slayer villain, what with the eyepiece, and she's a robot, could you, it's so subtle. And Dave Bautista as Drax is something to behold, there's more going on in his performance than just grunting as the strong character. He definitely can go there, but this character shines in the small, non-punchy moments more than the big, all-punchy moments, which is a sign of a good-ass character. It gets a little tougher to pin too much on the performances of the other two characters, considering the massive teams of people that had to work together to bring these people to life, but Bradley Cooper and Vin Diesel do really good work as Rocket and Groot, rounding out the team. Also, Lee Pace, somehow not international superstar and man of leisure and mystery, still, but he does really strong, thankless work as a villain, far more memorable than he should be. Ronin. Oh, and Glenn Close, John C. Riley, Jamin Hasu, and Benicio Del Toro are also in the movie too because Marvel really want, wanted you to notice this movie is a, bi a big deal. Hence all the members of the Academy Award Breakfast Circle there. So this movie begins with a 12 year old Peter trying so desperately as any child would to find anything not to deal with the death of his mother as it is happening but in a twist of plump narrative value that will land right on your jaw her dying wish is just for him to hold her hand as she dies to be held by her son as she passes on and he doesn't do it. Immediately, brilliantly, it was one of the most effective Marvel origin stories because I really cared. This is a pretty sobering way to start your breezy, fun summer action film. And that, right there, is a perfect illustration of why James Gunn was the perfect choice to helm this film. He allowed the emotions to have a little dirt on them. People ain't perfect, and these people certainly ain't perfect, and that's why we need them to win. Because watching them lose was like tasting the callous, lingering breaths of the Dark Lord for Munchleon. All hail for Munchleon. And I feel like I need to invent a new sort of term for this type of opening because for all of the soul devastating longing that it creates it does so in an amazingly breezy clip and introduces a lot of elements to Peter's journey like the awesome mix of music his mom gave him doubling as his soundtrack which is so awesome I just yet yeah, home run the music Peter's issues with not only authority but the idea of guardians as well because, I mean, he loses his legal guardians in one fell swoop, really even if he wasn't taken, I mean, how can he be a guardian? Peter not taking hands, okay he took her hand, we're good. Peter's pretty casual views on catastrophic uncaring violence? Peter's inability to face up with father figures because he really effed up with one of his first ones and facing any paternal pressure means facing undoubtedly the biggest mistake of his life. So that's a no to dads. 
I mean, I think it's somewhat noble that the characters of this film all begin their journey on screen as pretty much garbage people. Peter was a womanizing piece of donkey odor. Gamora is only one step away from Thanos, so her bad dude cred is maxed out. Drax is a pretty heartless killer hellbent on a whack revenge plan, aka kill Gamora because Ronan killed his child. Revenge killing kids is a super bad guy move. Rocket has a chip on his shoulder the size of perplexed ignorance about his own existence, and Groot is Groot. I am group. We know God! Their eventual turn to the side of good achieved, however, ridiculously, is earned. Everyone learns that even garbage people can be stronger as a family, and obviously that's some well-trodden ground for cinema, aka the outsiders overcome evil together as a family plot. But that, to me, is why this is so fascinating. There were millions of ways to tell this story wrong. Set the plot aside for a moment because no one gave this movie a chance because it explored classic story structures in a straightforward manner. We gave this movie a chance because the characters all somehow worked. And not just worked, were hilarious, endearing to an audience, and full of relatable flaws. I mean, how many movies have a dude who can whistle pathically, control some futuristic nerf we He whistles his enemies to death! Nope, totally cool. It's fine. Nothing weird there. And I think one of the things that helps this movie out in a subtle way was how weird it made the world around our eccentric heroes, grounding them in the world. I love the design of this thing, the way Ronan's ship creates this unrelenting feeling of momentum, the uniforms of the space stations, the characters, the way Nova Corp ships can link together, creating a webbing of sorts. From a military perspective, their vehicles are designed more defensively. That's just nice to see in a movie, winning by de-escalation, not violence. And that point is pretty important, I think. Rocket sacrifices their only ship, and Groot must sacrifice himself to save his family. So it makes sense that Rocket really feels that. Sort of like how Peter feels that, and Drax feels that, and Gamora feels that, and we feel that. And I think Marvel is understandably pretty gun-shy about killing characters see Civil War, but in a world where I'm not sure that James Gunn could allow Groot to totally die saving his friends, he still kind of did? I mean, Groot might reboot, but that Groot, the one we knew, is gone. Sure, the punch was pulled a bit, but if that punch being pulled means baby Groot, then please, by all means, continue pulling those punches. Guardians of the Galaxy is essentially about a scared young boy who made a psychologically devastating decision for himself, and that was before he was kidnapped by space people. He is flawed enough as a superhero to represent us. I mean, he did the coldest thing ever to a human he desperately loved, but we can't blame him. He's 12. As an adult, he needs his friends to pick him up because the uncaring world had broken him. They literally step into fire for Peter, a man mostly constructed out of mistakes. I mean, the dude kicks rats and generally treats people like things to be consumed and used. This isn't about punishing each other for our flaws, it's about how we fix them together. Every single character in this film makes a mistake that has measurable consequences on the direction of the plot. Hell, Drax almost gets all of them killed, including himself, but they accept that the person his world and his situation created were worth standing by. I don't just think this is the best Marvel movie, I think it's one of the best movies about friendship in sentence, full stop. This group of friends spend an entire film building trust and fixing each other's mistakes. As at the time of their entry into the story, they were all the dietary supplement version of small-time hooligans, so they need one another's assistance on the pathways to becoming the defenders of not just their own worlds, but each other's. Guarding a galaxy, so to speak, means defending a lot more than just your own culture. It means defending many, and that also means defending the people doing the wrong thing for the right reasons like Rocket flying a ship into the crashing ship, failing to do the thing he was attempting to do and destroying the only means of escape. So Groot has to die. Groot's death is just another sacrifice to fix their mistakes in the face of overwhelming power superiority. They trust each other, make mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake, but regroup every time, and that's why they win, because they're always picking each other up at any cost. That's a great message. You're gonna screw up 
but trust the ones around you to pick you up again. You need other people because you're not as much of a badass on your own as you thought you were. Hey, you know what? There's another name you might know me by. Star Lord. Who? Star Lord, man. I think character flaws stick out more noticeably than cheap one-liners or a gruff demeanor, especially in a genre so dominated by underwritten characters and gruff demeanors. They are imperfect people driven, all five of them, by things outside of their control. I feel for Peter because we all have regrets about all the things we didn't do, and Peter couldn't bring himself to grab his mother's hand before she died. It's imperfectness ad infinitum. He failed in a single moment that has permanent consequences. He is imperfect forever. I feel for Gamora because she is faced with an impossible choice, die or kill your sister, and that she has chosen to run from, complicating her safety and her journey. I feel for Drax because he lost his family and anchors to his world and he's trying to make his way in a land mostly foreign to him. I feel for Rocket because he is an anomaly, or more correctly, the creation of a lab. He's alone in dealing with this, and it manifests as anger. I feel for Groot because he was forced to make a decision knowing it would end his life, at least as he knew it. Guardians of the Galaxy is good because we felt it, it came out swinging and did things as outside the box as Hollywood's seen, but Gunn kept us looking at their flaws and we rooted for them because of it. Am I overstating these points? I, I don't think so. Sure, it's a big budget superhero film for a lot of ages, but I think that amplifies the success not detracts from it. If kids go to the theater and get a kick-ass space fantasy starring a diverse cast of characters that support each other despite their wildly different backgrounds and accept each other for the mistakes they make, no questions asked, yes, I think that's as big of a win as we could ever conceivably expect from a machine this large. I cared way more than I ever thought I would about an orphan with no bearing, a daughter with no out, a widower with no path, a raccoon with no family, and a tree with no purpose. <laughs> Thank you for checking out my show, Movies with Mikey. If you so kindly would do me the service of liking this video and subscribing to the channel because YouTube rules dictate that I have to say that or I'll be turned back into a fish. And I left that life behind. Be sure to also follow me on Twitter at MikeyFish. <laughs> at MikeyFace because that's where I interact with a lot of people about the show and share lots of news about upcoming episodes. Okay, we've been breezing through these last few episodes of quite the clip, so I see no reason not to keep that streak going. So the next four movies up for vote are Logan. And consider this your preemptive cordial spoiler one. Amelie, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, and The Hurt Locker. Make your votes in the comments and keep your heads high, friends.